When Mark Tilden first came up with the idea of Beam Robotics, possibly while getting fitted for a new fedora, he wanted to make robots that copied living organisms. The first B in Beam stands for biology after all. They were designed to copy living animals. At first this was mostly a reference to the way that the brains of these robots worked. They had a series of electronic neurons which communicated with each other in a similar fashion to the way the brains of living organisms work. However, over time this became more of a broad sense and really the ultimate goal was to build a robot that could keep itself alive by harvesting energy from its environment. The easiest way to do this was, of course, solar power. Solar was ubiquitous and um, very easy to integrate into an electrical system. Indeed, many of the earliest beam robots were solar powered, but this started to really take off and kind of consolidate itself into a simple single design in the early 2000s as the beam community started to spread across the internet. The design that was settled on was a simple two motor design which used often two small separate circuits that were each light sensitive to drive each motor. That way, if you arranged everything in the correct manner, the robot would steer itself toward the light and it could run off of very low light levels and power itself to try and get to higher light levels. These robots became known broadly as photo poppers. The photo is a reference to light and popper was a reference to the way the robots moved in short bursts of energy. The designs refined themselves to the point when they ran off very minimal components and they were able to be built in incredibly simple ways. Yet again, like a lot of beam robots, displayed surprisingly complex behavior. So let's look at one of my favorite designs, see how it works, and then see what it takes to build one. First, we'll start with the most simple version of this circuit. The heart of this is this little component right here, the flashing LED. So these are a small LED which has a circuit built into it, which means it flashes with no external circuitry. But we're going to be using it in a bit of a different way here. So what, the way this works is we've got a solar cell here and a capacitor. The solar cell charges up the capacitor and the voltage on the circuit rises. As it rises, current will flow, a tiny little bit of current will flow through the motor. Now a motor that isn't spinning, like a stalled motor, has very, very low resistance. So it'll flow through here, down here, through this resistor, and then through this flashing LED. Now when the voltage is below about two and a half or three volts, this will just try and turn on the circuit, but it won't be able to. It won't have enough voltage to, to, for anything to happen. As this voltage rises, the voltage potential here will get high enough that eventually this will turn on. When that happens, it will pull quite a bit of current. I mean, for this circuit, it's still a tiny amount. And it'll pull some through this transistor here. As it starts to do this, this transistor will start to conduct. Positive will flow to this transistor here, which will then start to turn on as well. As this turns on, it pulls this resistor down to ground which in turn turns on this transistor more and it's kind of a self-propagating loop. Once it engages fully, the motor can then drain the voltage or the uh, electricity from this capacitor and the motor will move for a short amount of time until this capacitor voltage gets down to about 0.7 volts at which point the gates of the transistors won't be able to stay engaged anymore and the circuit will reset. This is a type of circuit called a solar engine. I'll make a full video about those because they deserve one. Um, there's a whole group of them, but this is a very simple version and it will simply get to a certain voltage point and then discharge to another one and then it'll continue doing that. But there's actually one little bug on this circuit and that is that these flashing LEDs are actually light sensitive. So the more light falling on this, the slower it'll blink, the higher voltage we'll have to get to before this will be able to turn the circuit on. Now that's a bit of an annoying bug, but if we duplicate this circuit out here and build two of them, we can actually use that as a feature because the solar engine which has the most light will turn on later than the other one or be less likely to fire. So the robot, if these are arranged correctly, will turn toward the light. And then when both of those flashing LEDs have the same amount of light on them, they're both the same amount likely to fire and the robot will kind of walk itself side to side toward the light. Now, here we have the full circuit. So there's a couple minor changes from the, uh, from the previous one, which I'll point out. 
The first is you might notice this area has a little bit more complexity. And the reason behind that is because the perfect size for this resistor here is quite a bit different than the perfect size for this one. And on the old design, they kind of did double duty, so you had to make a compromise. But by making this the perfect turn-on for your motor, either smaller or a little bit bigger, depending on how big your motors are, um, we can add a larger resistor in series with the flashing LED here, and then couple those two circuits together with a capacitor. So when this finally gets up to the trigger voltage, it'll turn on, that current will cause a pulse to go through this capacitor, turn on this transistor, and then latch the whole circuit. Um, this way we can have a, a big enough resistor here, so not very much current flows until this gets up to the right voltage, which makes our circuit more efficient. And then we can also tune this a little bit better to run, depending on the motors you have. Now my motors I'm using here are tiny, so I use a relatively large resistor here, but you can use mm, two kilo ohm or even smaller, depending on how efficient your motor are. Generally, a less efficient motor will need a smaller resistor and vice versa. And that's a little bit of a troubleshooting tip when you're building your circuit as well. If you find that this pulses, the LED turns on, and this just moves, your motor moves for just a tiny bit, like a split second, and it keeps doing this without ever dumping the entire charge of the capacitor, go down in size for this resistor here, and that'll allow it to latch on a bit harder, allow your circuit to dump the entire capacitor out through the motor. Uh, another problem these circuits can run into is they can get locked up in really bright light. Again, if your motor's not that efficient and you have a really good solar cell, what will happen is it'll trigger, dump all that uh, current through your motor, but when it gets down to the shutoff voltage, there'll be enough current coming through the solar cells that it'll basically keep everything on. If it doesn't drop below about one volt or about 0.7 volts, it'll never unlatch these and it'll just continue to dump the current through the motor and keep these things running. Now, if you have really small motors, um, it's not really a problem because the motor resistance will be so low when it's stalled that it'll probably drain the capacitor no matter what. But if you have really big motors and really big solar cells, that can get, become a problem. I've also added another little bit to the circuit here. And this is a little uh, touch circuit. So I actually added these to both sides, but it was easier just to show one. So this is a small resistor. I used 33 kilo ohms. So just a tiny bit smaller than this one. And this will be connected to a touch sensor. So when my robot bumps into something, it'll close this sensor and it'll actually basically bypass the motor um, and resistor here with a slightly smaller value. That pushes the turn on voltage for this side lower than that side. So it's much more likely to fire and the robot will turn away from whatever it's bumping into. It can't reverse because there's no reversing circuitry in this one but it'll let it kind of avoid walls and stuff like that. And one little last note is the flashing LEDs are, since they are light sensitive, occasionally um, when it's really bright out, your flashing LED might never turn on no matter how high your voltage gets. If this happens, you can put a little bit of uh, heat shrink or uh, tape over top of the LED and just shade it a little bit. So you do that for both and that can increase the range of light at which your robot will function. All right, so that's how they work. Um, now let's, uh, Let's get out and build it. As always, you should breadboard your projects. I recommend starting with just one half of this so you can kind of get the component values um, matched up and all working and then build both halves on the breadboard. I did that and then I experimented with some different values as well. Here you can see I put a bit of tape on one of the flashing LEDs to make sure that it actually was reacting to light correctly. Once you have that all ready to go, then we can start to build it. I preformed mine and I didn't start with any specific plans, uh, but I just glued each individual um, set of transistors together. Make sure to mark which one's which somehow, otherwise uh, you could pretty easily get confused and it will not work. There's a couple uh, plans online to freeform both of the sides as one unit, but I decided to do each individual so I could kind of put them on each side of the robot. And I also used these uh, fun little electrolytic caps so the side kind of timing caps would match the main one. A quick note, when you do the main capacitor here, I started with a 1000 nanofarad and then I went to a 2200 later on. Um, but some people use bigger. I could probably go a little bit bigger. You don't want to go too big, otherwise your robot will just spin in a circle instead of moving itself toward the light. 
I freeformed the main body here out of uh, brass wire I had, and that's grounded to the negative uh, pole of the capacitor as well. And then I started here again, building that second set of transistors, glued them together, and then freeformed it kind of as a copy of the other one, but I wanted them to kind of sit, you can see, once it's above the frame and once it's below it. All the capacitors and uh, components were soldered in place first, just to make sure that everything would be in the right place. And then I soldered on both of the eyes or the flashing LEDs. You want these as wide apart or at least wider than the motors on your robot, just to give it a chance to navigate around shadows. If the eye goes into the shadow, it'll move the robot out of it and then it'll avoid the, the motor from hitting the whatever it's trying to avoid. I attached the motors with just a small amount of heat shrink tubing because this robot is so small and the motors are so tiny, it's more than strong enough in this application. And yes, I did my heat shrink tubing with a match. I don't know where my lighter or my heat gun are at the moment. I actually put a little uh, tire on, this, on these motors as well, which was made from just a section of uh, insulation stripped off a piece of wire and then some heat shrink tubing around that as well. And then I soldered out the motor. Make sure that one of your motors is gonna be opposite the other so they both spin in the same direction. It's a good idea to test beforehand so you don't end up with a robot that goes backwards. And then here I'm making these sensors for my robot. So I made these out of a very small piece of brass tubing and then the thinnest music wire I could find. So this is a, a tiny little piece and then the idea is that this will fit inside of that tube and then the end of the tube will kind of act as the, as the touch sensor. So as the robot deflects it, it'll touch that side and conduct the, or complete the circuit. I could have even used thinner music wire if there was one. This robot is not very strong, so it needs a really light touch to actuate those. And then I assembled this, and the way I actually assembled it, instead of gluing it all together, I pulled the, the inside part through and then soldered that resistor on. So that's what holds everything together and keeps everything lined up. And where, those, um, where the touch sensors are as well gives me a nice place to mount my solar cell. I used two three volt solar cells that are originally meant for calculators. They're not very efficient, but they are um, really useful because they have a very wide range of light levels they work in. I think they're designed to work indoors as well. And this is the finished robot. It took a little bit to tweak everything and get the solar cell in the right place and the feelers kind of the right shape, but afterwards it worked perfectly. Here you can see the bottom with the tiny little tires on there and you can see it moving around in the light here. It is extremely phototactic. It reacts to light extremely well. And even small differences in light on the eyes let it turn in those directions. So I'm really happy with the way it worked. It's amazingly fun to watch. And it's really interesting to see kind of the choices it makes, if you can call them that. It pops about every 20 to 30 seconds in sunlight and a little bit less indoors, but it will work in a very wide range of light. So I'm amazingly happy with how this little guy turned out. And that's it. That's the finished little robot here. So this is a super fun little project. It's also interesting how this robot uses the part that runs the kind of solar side of the circuit as the actual brains as well. And actually, if you think about it, the two individual circuits inside of this guy are kind of like a bi-core circuit in that they basically have two states they can be in. When one's in the state, the opposite side is in the opposite state. And then they're basically forced like that until the circuit resets itself. So in a way that this is kind of like a lot of the other beam circuits in that they have a, a neuron connection that runs the robot and decides which way it goes. So I hope you enjoyed that and I'll, uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.